So we are in the 40 days of Lent, 40 days in the desert. We have already begun the 40 days of Lent on February 14th when we went into the desert. So that's what, um, that's what I want to talk about today more than anything because uh, we really haven't um, discussed much about Lent and the significance of the 40 days uh, and it's important for us uh, as we journey through these 40 days to consider what is the meaning of Lent because there's a deep meaning to the entire season there, there are different seasons that we have during the year as Catholics. We start off with the Advent season, then we have ordinary time, and now we are in Lent, and then we'll have ordinary time again. Uh, and so what is Lent? And so as we prepare to look at the uh, meaning of Lent, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time that we are able to open up your word to nourish us, um, to strengthen us, to fill us with all that we need during our Lenten observance. May this Lent change us, change our life, and transform us. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So numbers have deep meaning in the Bible. Uh, we know that the number seven, for example, refers to uh, God, refers to perfection. So God is perfect, and so whenever the number seven is mentioned, it refers to God. The number six uh, refers to the devil. It's the number of imperfection. Hence, the book of Revelation prevent, presents to us the devil as 666. Six, six. And the number 40 has also a very deep meaning in the Bible. That is why there are 40 days in Lent. Uh, the number 40 in the Bible refers to a time of transformation. So, whenever the Bible talks about 40 days, Say to yourself, well, I look at my calendar and there are a lot more than 40 days in Lent. That is because Sundays are not counted as part of Lent. So, whatever it is that your Lenten observance entails, Sunday is not part of it. So, if you gave up chocolate or whatever it is that you're fasting during Lent, uh, you can have your chocolate on Sunday. <laughs> but the number 40, the Bible is clear that God considers 40 days a spiritually significant time period. Whenever God wanted to prepare someone for his purposes, he took 40 days, 40 years wandering in the desert and then they spent 40 days in the promised land and they were transformed so 40 David was transformed by Goliath's 40 day challenge Elijah was transformed when God gave him 40 days of strength from a single meal the entire city of Nineveh was transformed when God gave the people 40 days to change. Jesus was empowered 
by his own 40 days in the wilderness. And then after the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples and apostles, transforming them. And they were transformed by their 40 day experience with Jesus after his resurrection. So the next 40 days, if you enter into them, will transform you. God is giving us every single year 40 days in order to transform us. Now just like David had the 40 day challenge with Goliath, you have your own challenge with Goliath, whatever that may be. Maybe it's your sickness, maybe it's a disease, maybe it's a person in your life who is after you. Who is your Goliath? Noah had 40 days of rain. You may be in the 40 days of rain in your own life, flooding. So, we all have the 40 days in our life. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. And let's look at Luke chapter 4 from verse 1 through 13, the temptation of Jesus. Luke chapter 4 from verse 1 to 13. Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the desert. This is very important. The Bible makes it very clear in in the Gospels, not just in Luke, but we also can read this in Mark's Gospel, that Jesus is led into the 40 days of the desert by the Spirit. So God leads us into the desert. In other words, God leads you into the challenges of your life. God led Jesus into the desert because the desert would transform him. God led Noah into the rain. God allowed David to ha have the challenge with Goliath. So your problems in your life, your challenges are permitted by God. God is allowing for you to have the challenges that you have because those challenges, those problems, your suffering, your sickness, you know, the, the stuff that you deal with in your family, it's all there to change you, to transform you. You think about it, you know, you're not the same person you are today that you were before your divorce. You're not the same person that you are today before you had cancer. You're not the same person that you are today before they fired you from your work. You're not the same person that you are today you know, before you went through any and all suffering and obstacle. You're not the same person you are today that you were before you went through the depression before you lost your house, before you had that addiction, and you went through it. See, God is after developing us in this life. God is after developing you into a holy disciple. And part of that holiness process is to allow you to go through the desert. You see, the Bible says that we are like gold for God, that we are more precious than gold in the sight of God. And in order for gold to be refined, the Bible says, it has to go through the fire. It has to be, you know, in order for the impurities to be removed from the gold, it has to be put through the fire. Otherwise, it's not perfected. And the Bible says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. 
Hence, God is after perfecting us. Not that we're going to be perfect in this life. God knows that it's all a, a process of our entire life. The perfection process continues our entire life. But we are in the process of being perfected. And in the midst of the process, we are being put through the fire, through the desert. So Jesus was transformed by his 40 days in the desert. The Spirit led him into the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. In all that time he ate nothing, so he was hungry when it was over. And the devil said to him, If you are God's son, order this stone to turn into bread. The devil's always tempting you in order for you to give up. Don't, don't continue the challenge of the 40 days. Give up. You know, don't keep going through that process of getting out of alcoholism or your depression, or your drug addiction. Don't keep going to the Gamblers Anonymous meetings that will keep you away from the casino. Don't keep going to the counseling that you have been taking. Don't take your antidepressant medication. Look how it's making you, you know. It's dumbing you down, it's doing this to you, it's doing that, you know. You'll be better off by, you know, the devil's always don't, don't look to change, just give up, that's what he was trying to say to Jesus as well, and he didn't, and he came out way better at the end of this 40 day challenge in the desert. It was after the desert experience that Jesus begins his life of ministry. It's out, out of the desert that his strength comes in order for him to heal people, to raise the dead, to bring hope to people. It's out of the desert. I would not be the priest I am today or the human being that I am today if it wasn't for the desert experiences in my own life. I would not be the minister of God that I am, if it, particularly here in, in Holy Family Parish, ministering to a very large uh, Hispanic community, immigrant community. If I did not have the immigrant experience, I would not be able to understand them. I would not know what it is that they're going through if I hadn't gone through that myself. It was a very painful experience to leave my family, my town, my country, and move here to the United States is something that was unknown. But God was preparing me for where I am right now. It was terrible. It was a terrible experience. You know, you're, you're leaving everything that you know. You, 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 you move to a, a place where you don't speak the language. You know, it's a, but I wouldn't be the priest I am today, the minister of God, the human being that I am today, if it wasn't for that experience. If it wasn't for the experience of my parents' divorce, terrible divorce, I would not be able to understand people in their own pain. If it wasn't for the experience of being bullied in school, I would not be able to understand that pain. If it wasn't for all of the painful experiences, I could go through a list. God went on developing me and he's continuing to develop me through the painful experiences that I continue to go through. Do you want me to share some of those with you? I know you do, but I won't. <laughs> but in other words, we all have them. We all have painful experiences, whatever it is that you're going through. You know, we all go through things in our life. Every single one of them. In other words, yeah. You know, all of us have warts and uh, stuff that is there. You know, you, you go through one challenge and then 
things are going great, and then another one comes. Uh, you would not be the person you are today if it wasn't for the pain and the struggle that you went through, the pain and the struggle with losing your child or losing your husband. You wouldn't be the person you are today. Uh, we, I, we just celebrated here a couple weeks ago the one-year anniversary of the death of uh, an 11-year-old girl who was hit by a garbage truck not too far here on a, on a street corner. And her mom, uh, her mom's name is Encarnacion, before, uh, before this happened, she was not close to God at all. She said, you know, she believed in God, but she wasn't very strong in her faith. God was not very important in her life. She believed in God, but God wasn't an integral part of her life. And two weeks ago at the 10 a.m. Mass, she stood up at the one year anniversary and she says, you know, uh, she knows that it was going through this experience that her daughter's death, that her daughter is responsible for her now being in church, for her daughter brought her to church, brought her to God. It was that painful experience. We have a gentleman, his name is Chris, he comes to the Bible study here. Sometimes you probably see him with his dog. His dog's name is Obi. He comes with his uh, wife. Uh, and Chris went through a terrible uh, sickness in his life, terrible sickness, and after that he almost died because of this sickness that he went through, and as a result of this sickness, he's now blind, and he said to me something that has really made a great impact that is, you know, I thank God that I am blind, he says, because I used to have eyes, but I did not see. Now I don't have eyes, but I do see. Becoming blind made me see. So, hopefully there's some sort of a light bulb that is being put on in our own spiritual being at this time for the Lord to allow us to see. I would pray that we wouldn't have to have something as terrible as blindness happen to us in order for us to see. Jesus wants to heal our blindness, all of our blindness during our own 40 days. But we have to allow him to do that. The devil said, if you are God's son, order this stone to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, human beings cannot live on bread alone. Man does not live on bread alone. Then the devil took him up and showed him in a second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all of this power and all of this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me and I can give it to anyone I choose and all this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus answered the devil. The Bible says, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him alone. Isn't this what the devil does with all of us? You can have all of this if you worship Him. Look at the jackpot in the casino. Come and worship me. 
Look, you can be happy in other words. You win the jackpot, you'll be happy. Play the lottery, you'll be happy once you win all those millions of dollars. Why don't you all do me a big favor and today? Google people who have won the lottery, won hundreds of millions of dollars, and look up what happened to their lives. How miserable their lives became after they won the lottery. <coughs> you see, that is the lie of the devil. The devil wants to lie to you, making you think that all your problems will be solved if you win the jackpot in the casino or the lottery. That money is the solution to your problems. Money is the root of your problems when you, become, when you become enamored and in love with money. There's nothing wrong with having money. It's, money's not the problem. It's the love of money that's the problem. When you love money more than God, when you serve money more than you serve God, that's where the problem becomes. Nothing wrong with being rich. We're not communists or socialists. They tried that all over the world and look what happens. Look at Venezuela today. People who have had their organ transplants are now dying because there's no drugs that they need for their immune system. Just recently read about a girl who had her kidneys transplanted a couple years ago and the drugs that she needs to take every single day in order for her body not to reject this foreign organ in her body that they don't have those drugs and not only is there no drugs available but she needs dialysis and she can't get that either now. That is the result of socialism and communism. It's pure evil and it's godless. Godless. There's no God in socialism or communism. There's nothing wrong with people being rich. In fact, some of the most generous people are rich people. The poor need the rich and the rich need the poor. It's the way it works in the world. And Jesus said to us very clearly in the Bible, the poor you will always have with you because it keeps the rich people humble. The poor need the rich and the rich need the poor. It's the love of money that's the problem. It's hoarding that's the problem. It's all mine. No, it's not all mine. It's mine to give. What I have is not mine. What I have is mine in order for me to share it. God gives me in order for me to be able to share it with others. God gave you a brain, gave you business smarts. Are you doing with that? Or you know, you're a doctor or you're a lawyer or whoever you are, you're successful. That's wonderful. What are you doing with that in order to benefit the life of all the people around you? The devil wants to tempt us. Don't fall into his traps, thinking that something out there will make you happy, or that someone out there will make you happy. The only one who makes us happy is God. That's what the Bible says. God is the only one that makes man happy. Only one. I don't pretend to know the ways of God, neither should any of us. I don't know who's going to be saved and who isn't. That's why I trust in God's love and mercy. For all I know, you know, I might not be saved. How do I know? Anything, you know, it's all... 
the minute I begin to think that I have it all and that I'm saved and you know, and that's the beginning of the start of my problems because it's the beginning of pride. That's the devil, the prince of pride. Jesus is the king of humility. St. Paul in the Bible said, when you think of other people, you think of them as more than you, better than you, and you as less, because that's what leads you to the right mindset, a, a, a humble mindset. Religion has some people so trapped that they would let their child die without a blood transfusion. Yes, your own child. We don't want to become like that. So in other words, let's confront our demons. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's confronting the devil. He did battle with the devil. How many people here today will avoid confronting their own demons because they are afraid? How many people, how many of us will refuse to confront the demons of our past as the fact that, you know, you need to confront the fact that you were raped or abused or mistreated or that your parents hurt you or that your husband or ex-spouse hurt you by cheating on you or abusing you. You have to confront your demons. This weekend, I will be Friday, Saturday and Sunday on retreat with more than 20 women and men who have had abortions or who participated in an abortion. They are coming this weekend to confront their demon. The demon that is bringing them down. And they will become renewed if they enter into that wilderness experience this weekend. It's a very painful process. Very painful. How many people need to forgive and let go of something that someone did to them? Or a past hurt experience? How many people feel alone and are single but refuse to reach out and seek a suitable partner for themselves? How many people have not been to confession in years and still refuse to go because they are afraid? This Lent, I want you to give God a gift. Give God your sins. Give Him your sins. Don't give Him your chocolate your wine. Give him your sins this Lent. That would be a perfect gift to God. Some, some of us work and work and work and think that we need to work and work and work. Work is our idol and the pursuit of money, fame and status. Confront that demon that says to you, you need more money, more things, a bigger house. Your children need you. The people in your life need you, not more stuff and more money. How many people have people in their lives that are bringing them down, abusing them? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. The only way to get better is to enter the desert experience and confront the demons that are afflicting you. Face them head on and run from them to an escape. All of this can happen if you go into the wilderness and there in the desert as Jesus was, you will be reminded of the great hunger and thirst in the desert. How hungry you are for acceptance, for love, for security. How much we hunger for a better family, a better world, a better country, a better church. How hungry we are for a different job, better co-workers, a different environment. How hungry we all are for, for, for something different. And in the desert, the dryness will be quenched by God. He will quench it because He loves you. So what do you hunger for? Why don't you take some time right now to think about that? What do you thirst for? Maybe you are sick or your family member is sick and you are hungry to get better or to see them get better. 
Maybe you've lost a loved one and you want the hunger that you feel, the hunger of loss and the pain to end. So, what is it that you're hungry for? Not by bread alone does, human being, does the human being live, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The temptations Jesus underwent were to escape the mission of his humanity, to deny our dependent condition on God. Jesus came to be one of us for solidarity, to show us how to live. If he did not confront his hunger, his thirst, his demon, he would no longer be human. But he was human in all things except sin. Jesus entered not only the desert, but the hunger as well. He resisted the devil and he showed us how to do it. And because he did it, and because he was there before, you and I can do it as well. Because he's with us, he's helping us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we thank you, Lord, for this time that we have looked at your word and how you were tempted to think that you couldn't, that God wasn't with you, that you were alone in the desert. But we are not alone in the desert. You are with us. You are walking with us. And as we confront the devil in our own desert experience, we are emboldened. We are made firm. in our resolve to continue our walk with you, our walk toward heaven. We want to experience some of that heaven here on earth, experience your presence that fills us with great love and courage and hope today and every day as we glorify you by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.